So we will be in James chapter 3. Obviously, I, uh, every week will give us a, a little bit to kind of recap a little bit, just, just a little bit, just kind of catch us up. Remembering, all this does go together. So though we're in James 3, we can't forget James 1 because James 1 really informs what we're going to uh, discover here in James chapter 3. And so in, in James chapter 1, uh, just a couple of things I want to draw our attention to to make sure that we bring these into our, our study today in James chapter 3. First thing is this. In James chapter 1, it says this. Um, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because it develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so it may mature, complete, and not lacking anything. As we said several times, and by the time we're, we're done with this, you'll know this uh, hopefully in your bones. The word persevere in the Greek is upomeno. It means to be under. That's upo and meno really is often translated abide. And so when it's saying persevere, this is not something saying in your trial consider it pure joy. You just have to um, buck up buttercup. You have to just hold on and muscle through it. You just got to make your way through it. That is not what James is saying. That's not what God's encouraging us to do. Though many times we'll read this and we'll, we'll think, oh my gosh, I just have to persevere. And if I persevere, then I will make myself mature, complete, and not lacking anything. But this is not what James is saying. That Greek word upomeno means to remain under and uh, abide. And so what perseverance actually means is in our trial, hold on to the Lord. Persevere in relationship with Jesus. Hold on to that uh, intimate relationship with the Lord because he is the one who's going to see us through and he is the one in relationship together who will make us mature, complete, and not lack anything. I don't make myself mature. I don't make myself complete. I don't make myself lacking nothing. God does. But in my trial, I'm not alone. And in my trial, I have the Lord. And in my trial, he will walk with me through the trial. And through that, he'll produce in me uh, a maturing and a, a completeness and making sure I'm not lacking anything. What is he doing? He's making me more like him. I'm experiencing him in the midst of the trial. And as I experience him, I'm receiving from him these things. It's making me more like him. So what is maturity? Maturity is to be more like Jesus. And we become more like Jesus, not by saying, hey, I'm going to strive to be more like Jesus. No, we become more like Jesus by relating to him through our trials and in that he imprints who he is upon us. This is what it means in James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because it develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work. Perseverance is that abiding must finish its work so we may mature complete not lacking anything the other thing i want to do is in james chapter 3 we're going to we're going to talk about the tongue today and i want you to see that james chapter 1 actually talks about it beforehand uh, in james chapter 1 verse 26 i will just to turn back there real quick uh, james 1 verse 26 says this if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue he deceives himself and his religion is worthless uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago, but I just want to remind us, if anyone considers himself religious, so if you consider yourself religious, if you consider yourself someone who walks well with Jesus, if you do, but you cannot control your tongue, maybe, maybe there's an issue in your walk with the Lord. This is what it's saying. Now, James chapter 1 and here in verse 26 is just alluding to that, and it just kind of throws it out there. It doesn't say anything else about it. It just moves on. And it moves on to the next thing. It says this, verse 27, religion that our God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And, and so basically two things. He's just saying, if you want to be mature, here's some litmus tests. If you want to ask yourself, am I mature in the Lord? Here's a litmus test number one. What's coming out of your mouth? That will tell you a little bit about your maturity in the Lord. Second thing is, uh, how are you caring for people? Are you loving like Jesus? Are you loving the Lord like Jesus? Are, are, are you loving the Father like Jesus? And are you loving others like Jesus? So there's two litmus tests. Chapter 2 deals with, basically, the second litmus test. Chapter 3 goes back. It's, not, it's, it's interesting because it's not really um, chronological. You'd think it would start off like, okay, let's start with the tongue. And it doesn't. It starts actually with the second one. And so chapter 2 is actually about the second one. And then here in chapter 3, it's going to go back and it's going to unpack what does it mean about the tongue. So this morning, we are going to unpack the tongue. James chapter 3. 
not many of you should presume to be teachers, it says. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, brothers, because you know we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body sets the whole course of his life on fire. It's set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea, are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father and we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. James talks to us about the tongue and he says a few things that seem a little strong. He says, let's get this again. What did he say? This is kind of crazy. The tongue is a fire. He says the tongue is a fire. He says a world of evil among the parts of the body. If you want to say, if, if we're talking about the parts of the body, he says the tongue is a world of evil among all the parts. He says it sets the course of his whole life on fire. And it is set on fire by hell. When we consider the tongue, James is pretty strong about what is going on with our mouths. You know, there's a proverb, I, I like to quote it. In fact, the first time I, I actually quoted this was when um, I was kind of put on the spot. I'm, you, you may or may not know this about me because I know my job probably doesn't present me this way. I'm really shy. I don't like to be the center of attention. I don't like to be in front of people. I don't like to uh, be put in those spots. Yet, when it comes to teaching the Bible, uh, God does something to me, and I can't wait to go teach His Word, and He just kind of takes over a little bit, and it's, it's just different. But by and large, left to my own devices, I don't want to be a center of attention at all. And so I had a, a surprise birthday party, and there's like 30 or 40 people there, and, and I'm already feeling awkward. And, um, you know, we're in a restaurant, and there's this long table, and some guy at the end says, Hey, can you give us a... a a word from the Lord. And I'm like, I'm in a restaurant. I definitely don't want to do this. I don't want to make it. I'm like, so I'm like, God, what do I say? What do I say? Like, how, how do I get out of this? And he puts this proverb in my heart. And so this is what I said, because I wanted to get out of this. When words are many, sin's not absent. And I sat down. <laughs> Nothing else to say. When words are many, sin's not absent. It's a proverb. And, and the reality is, is that the more that we talk, the more that sin tends to come out. And, and the reality is that other powers tell us that the righteous will weigh the heart before it speaks. We have to think about the words that come out of our mouths. Do I want to say this? I mean, how many times have you you've said something and you're like, come back? You wish you could put it back in, but it never comes back in. It's already out there. See, the, the tongue is a fire set on fire by hell itself. And there are many things that come out of the mouth we wish we had never said that causes uh, impacts in negative ways. Does this mean we shouldn't talk? No. It means that we should be aware of what effects the tongue can have. And the inverse is also true, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. As much as the tongue can be set on fire by hell, the tongue of a believer can be set on fire by the Spirit of God to bring health, wholeness, encouragement, and many other things. But we should be aware of our tongue. Now we're going we're gonna to work our way through in order a little bit and uh, 
try to unpack what James is saying here. Uh, see, what happens is there's a verse right here in chapter 3, verse 1. It's often quoted and often quoted out of context. And when it's quoted out of context, it gives a whole different meaning. And it oftentimes will cause people to respond certain ways that, that James is not saying and also to feel like, oh, I'm off the hook a little bit. Verse 1, not many of you should presume to be teachers, brothers, because you know we who teach will be judged more strictly. This is a verse that sometimes people are like, well, I'm off the hook. I, I don't teach. Or people will say, you know what? I don't want to teach because I want to be judged more strictly. Well, the thing is we got to understand really what James is saying here. And again, our English translation is correct. However, it's not the most helpful because we don't um, know really what this word teacher really means and what it means in context. To James's audience, it makes perfect sense and complete sense because their society ran this way. To us, um, when we have a teacher, it's kind of like, okay, stands up in front of the class, teaches. There's not an engagement of relationship of any kind. It's a big kind of lecture hall type thing and you go home. That was my teacher. I don't really know him that well and he taught me some truths and, and went home. That's not their style of teaching. In, in fact, this word for teacher in the Greek is used over 40 times. Its most common use is associated with Jesus. And, and almost every reference, it's not all, but almost every reference that this word teacher is used, it is about Jesus teaching someone or describing Jesus as a teacher. Uh, some translations, depending on the translation you have, won't translate it teacher, will translate it as master. And so it further confuses the matter because in English, in James, they'll translate it as teacher. In other places where it's Jesus, they translate it as master. I'm going to show you a, a couple of things here on the screen. Uh, an example, that word teacher there is the same word in Greek. Matthew 8, 19. Then the teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, speaking to Jesus, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. So it's a title. It's almost like in, in certain translations, it doesn't say teacher. There, it says, master, I'll follow you wherever you go. Here's another one. Um, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher, or why does your master, eat with tax collectors and sinners? So it's again, it's a title. Why does, why does he do this? Um, and then Matthew 10, 24 to 25, though I could show you 40 of these. I'm, I'm not, I'm done with three. Um, Matthew 10, 24 to 25. The student is not above the teacher, nor servant above his master. It's enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more are the members of his household? What happens is this, is that Jesus is a rabbi. Rabbinical teaching is more about experiential learning. It's more of apprenticeship type learning. It's more like, hey, if I'm walking with Jesus, if he's my teacher, I'm calling him my teacher, I'm like, I'm going to walk and I'm going to do life with you and I'm, you're going to rub off on me. I'm going to see how you do life and I'm going to become more like you. So it's, it's more about becoming an expert in something and living in such a way that people want to become like you and receive from you experientially uh, the truths of either a profession or of life. And so basically they're looking at Jesus as a rabbi. They're looking at Jesus as one who is an expert and they want him to rub off on them. Put that in the context of James. Not many of you should presume to be someone who walks maturely with the Lord in such a way that you should rub off on someone else. Maturity here is really what I think it means by teacher. Not maybe we should presume to be teachers, what it says, but Jesus is living his life, and it's most often used with Jesus as a demonstration of how to live life. And so it's saying, not many of you should presume to be someone who could demonstrate how to live the Christian life. Because you know we who um, live and present ourselves in that way will be judged more strictly. Now, I point that out because I think actually it's something we should all aspire to. I think most of us will read this and go, well, I'm not going to stand in front of people and I'm not going to teach. No, but you're going to live life among people. People are always watching you. People are always interacting with you. And you are rubbing off on people in the way that you live your lives. And hopefully Jesus is what's rubbing off. Hopefully you are living your life in such a way with Jesus and persevering with Jesus, James said in James chapter 1, persevering with him, abiding with him, that he begins to rub off on us. And so what people experience from us is Jesus himself. We've technically become mature. Now, because maturity and one of the litmus tests is what comes out of our mouth, this is why James now continues on. He says, look, we all stumble in many ways. And so he's even saying those who think that they're walking well with the Lord, he's like, look, we all stumble in many ways. Let's just 
continue to remain humble. We all stumble in many ways. It says this, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man. I say again, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. What I think he's trying to say is, if you can control this, you're going to have self-control in every aspect of your life. But this is often where almost anyone, regardless of how mature you think you are, will stumble. And so he's saying, pay attention to your mouth. Pay attention to the tongue. Pay attention to what's coming out. Because all of us stumble in many ways. And if anyone is never at fault in what they say, you're a perfect man. So let that just be a, a beginning where basically God's saying this. If you think you're high and mighty in the Lord, cool, not questioning that. You're probably still going to have moments that come out of your mouth that are sinful and shouldn't have been said. And if you're able to control that, you'll be able to control everything. Don't worry, it will get, we'll get some good news later. Okay, <laughs> okay but it, I mean, it, it does get a little bit better. It says this. Um, this is not better. I'm, that's sarcastic. Uh, when we put, which I shouldn't be doing on a message about the tongue, but hey, there you go. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So let's just take two examples. Uh, you put bits in the mouths of, a, of an animal or a horse, you can just control it. It doesn't take much to take a big horse and tell that horse where you want it to go. It's just giving an example. a really small thing, just a little bit in the mouth, and it will take it where it wants to go. And it says, or take these ships. Just, just think of like Carnival Cruise Line, this big, huge thing, or think of a big, huge barge. It would be like the biggest ship you can imagine. And, and with that, as big as it is, and as, if it's a sailboat, all the sails, all the winds that power it, the reality is... It's a very small rudder that steers it. Now, why would he point that out? Because of the parts of the body, this is a pretty small thing. It's not very big. But as he says in, in here, it's like it steers and sets the course of the whole life. The, the things that come out of the mouth are really important. and What the tongue says are really important. And, and pay attention. And we often don't pay attention to this because it's, like, it's, it's a very small thing. And he's saying, no, it's... It, it's like these things that, though small, it has great power. Likewise, it says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of forest fires recently. It's always on the news, right? There's big, huge forest fires, acres and acres and acres and acres and miles and miles and miles of forest are just burning. And how they start? A small spark. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea, are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. Restless. Hey, you ever find yourself in this spot? I mean, self-disclosure, I find myself in this spot where you feel like you got to say something. Like, you know, people will often apologize and they'll, they'll say something. They wish they could take it back and like, I'm, I'm sorry, I, just, I, I had to say it. No, you didn't. But it's a restless. It's just, it's just, it's just, it, we always feel like it's got to come out. We got to say it and stuff like that. There's often times we'll feel confident about what we're saying, which has more to do with our pride. And we're confident about it. And it's like, I just had to. And sometimes even believe this, believers will say, I felt like the Spirit of the Lord was putting something. I just had to. I, was, I, I could not say it. Actually, Scripture says that the voice of the prophetic is under the control of the prophet. So you have complete control over it. And you, you can. And you have to weigh and say, is the Lord prompting me to? Or am I just wanting to? But consider this. He says, all kinds of birds, reptiles, creatures of the sea, all kinds of animals, they're being tamed. There's an alligator. 
a ferocious animal that comes out of um, lakes and rivers in, in the south. We've tamed it. That guy's putting his face right up to it. No big deal. Here's a little girl with a lion. He's tamed it. That is a killer whale. I picked it because of his name. Killer. She's just riding on his belly. We've tamed it. James is saying, see, you can tame these things. And no one can tame this. It goes on and says this, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. He's saying this. You know, with this tongue, here's what happens. Pay attention, follower of Jesus, to this one. Because with the tongue we will praise our Lord and Father, and we will curse men who have been made in God's likeness. You know, here's, here's how that happens. Have you ever been frustrated with someone? I mean, you never have. Never been frustrated. And under your breath, you've never, you know, like started calling them names or anything like that because you're so angry and so frustrated and so um, upset. Right? Basically what happens is we can praise the Lord and we can curse men. We might use curse words about them. There's two. Or, or we might do this. We might um, praise the Lord but then tell somebody um, else something about, uh, let me give an example, um, Eddie, sorry. You're just, you're just there. I'm just going to go over there and talk to Chris about you. And, you know, I might praise the Lord, and then I could just talk poorly about Eddie and talk about different things about Eddie, things I, I don't like about Eddie. Eddie, I love you, man. Um, but if I'm doing that, I'm praising the Lord, and, and I'm cursing someone that God has made. I don't need to spend my life looking around saying, Eddie is a man that God has made. He's a creation of the Lord. And if I am cursing him, I'm actually cursing the Lord. Because if I'm, if, if I'm putting him down, if I'm degrading him, if I'm belittling him, if I'm, uh, gosh, me wrong, if I'm doing any of those things, well, not only am I doing that to Eddie, I'm basically saying, God, you didn't make a good thing when you made him. See, what should be coming out of the tongue is praise for the Lord and praise for everything he created. And sometimes what that requires is this, this little prayer. And I don't know if it's part of your prayer life, but I, I hope and pray it is after today. God, give me eyes to see people the way you see them. God, give me eyes to see people the way that you see them. So the words that come out of my mouth are the way you see them. So I'm encouraging, I'm building up, I'm breathing life, and I'm causing someone to be seen in the way that God sees them. But what happens is, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and we curse men who've been made in God's likeness. And James goes on and it says this. It says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and still water, or can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Brothers, can a fig tree bear olives? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What's he saying? You have the Spirit of God in you. And what should be flowing out is constant praise in both directions, this way and that way. And when it does, that's the way it should be. But what happens is, if there's praise this way and cursing that way, then what happens is you got two things coming out of the same mouth. That can't be. You can't have salt water and fresh water coming out of the same place. You can't have a fig tree bear olives. That's not the way it works. And so the positive encouraging sign is, child of God, do you know who you are? And the encouraging thing is, child of God, do you know what's uh, living and residing within you? The Holy Spirit dwells within you. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, He has made your heart His home. He dwells within you. And what should come out are the things of the Lord. And if you find two things coming out, it's like, what, what's going on? Because there's, there's this source coming from the Lord that should be bubbling out. And if it isn't, James is saying, this shouldn't be. This shouldn't be. See, um, Jesus put it this way. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, it says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So why is James saying it shouldn't be? Because your heart should be full of the Lord. 
And it should be had all these things stored up from the Lord, and that's what should come out. If other things are coming out, then the heart has something else stored in it. And the question is, what is stored there? How are we spending our lives to invest to the things that are being stored within the heart? I mean, every waking moment we have a choice about what we want to deposit here. Because people are making withdrawals from here. What do you want to put in it? You know, when you get your, your paycheck, you go and you, you take your paycheck and you deposit it in, in a bank so that either you or someone else can withdraw something from it. And God's saying this, if, if you've got the Holy Spirit within you, how are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And Ephesians 5 tells us how we're filled. I'm, I'm not going to belabor this because I've taught this so many times in here, but Ephesians 5 tells be filled with the Spirit of God. And if you're filled, then that's what's going to come out. How are you filled? It says, uh, be in the Word and talk to one another about the Word. It, it says, uh, sing and make music in your heart to God and worship Him. It says, give thanks in every circumstance and says, submit one to another and serving one another around us. And if you do those things, the Holy Spirit fills us. What's stored up in the heart? It comes from these things. It's, it's being in the Word and then talking to each other. It's worshiping. It's being thankful. And it's uh, being like Jesus and, and serving all around us. And the Holy Spirit fills us. And that's what's stored up. And then what will come out is, is the Lord. But see, the tongue wants to do some things. Uh, the, the tongue, because it's set on fire by hell, as James says, the, the tongue, as, as Satan wants to use it, he wants to use the tongue to devour, to tear down, to d defend myself. I, I don't really care what's going on in your life, I'm just going to defend myself. Um, to sow seeds so people see others a certain way, and to boast and brag, among other things. But the tongue, it, it could build up, it could extend grace, it could extend mercy. Uh, the tongue could instruct gently in the ways of God. The tongue could encourage. It could breathe life into people, and it could pour, pour out hope. This is what it could do. But James is saying he finds it doesn't. In First Peter, um, it's interesting. I, I, I want to bring First Peter in for a very specific purpose. You realize that James and Peter are the, the two pastors, basically, of the Church of Jerusalem. And if you actually were to read James and you read Peter, that you'll see there's so many similarities between what the two books are saying. Uh, Peter puts it this way. He says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may be, you may be able to pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. There's your voice. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in his various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Do you understand that when you use your mouth, and when I use my mouth, what should be coming out of it are the very words of God. You know, I, I love what Chris did this morning with um, our family time and asking people to pray. What I liked about what he did is he said, hey, I think people got a lot of things on their hearts, and what we're going to do is we're going we're to take those things to the Lord. And, um, he, he actually used this phrase, which is interesting to me. He said, we're going to pour out your heart. It was a, a, a little phrase he kind of used a little bit, which is exactly what's on my heart to share for the rest of this message. And so what happened is, is uh, he invited us to kind of share what was going on, and then we, we prayed and we took it to the Lord. What, what happens with the tongue, and why the tongue is so dangerous is because of what's stored up in it. And I want to give you an answer. I don't think James really gives us the answer. I think James makes us aware of a problem. But I believe the rest of Scripture gives us an answer for how to deal with the tongue. And God put some very specific things on my heart about how to communicate this to you. So um, I, I need a little bit of help. And um, Hanger, if you don't mind coming up. Um, I didn't tell you about this. I apologize. Um, but you're going to be uh, an example. Oh. And uh, so just stand there for a second. So I've got a cup here, and, and um, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a whole bunch of different, can, can you see there's a whole bunch of different colored things in there? There's red, there's blue, there's white, there's green. They're, they're all little hole, hole punches and stuff like that. So they're all in this jar. And, and so really what happens is if you let this jar represent your life, uh, the, the jar and represent the, the heart a little bit, it's full of some stuff. What might it be full of? I, I think what happens in life, we have fears, things we're afraid of, and you know what? They're, they're stored up in the heart. There's concerns that we have. There's hard things we go through. There's the trials that James talks about. There's anger, and we store it up in here, and 
And there's all kinds of, of different frustrations that get stored up in here. What do you do with this? What do you, what do, you do with these things, that, that the anger, the frustrations, the fears, the concerns, the hardships, the, hardships, the heartaches, the, all the different things? What, what do you do with them? Well, the common response is, I need to go vent. I need to go find someone i got to vent. And whether you tell them you're venting or you don't tell them you're venting, you're venting. And what happens is the tongue starts to speak out of the things that are stored up. So fear is running our life. Fear is what comes out. If anger is stored up, anger comes out. If bitterness is stored up, bitterness comes out. If um, uh, all the heartaches are there, it, is, it all comes up and it comes out. Because it's a restless thing. And it needs to come out. It needs to go somewhere. Like If you stuff this in, it's going to completely destroy you. It's got to come out. Everybody knows that. So we have a, a thing we, we vent. And, and sometimes we call our venting in, in uh, Christian circles, uh, could you pray for me, brother? And now I'm going to tell you all the stuff that's in my heart, which is really not really an invitation for really prayer. We just cloak it with that word, could you pray for me, when really what we're doing is just really venting. It's good to have people pray, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. But basically, Chris, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to throw up all over you. And Because uh, what happens is... What, I see why you didn't tell me now. Yeah. I really like that. Right? Well, I didn't really want you to do that, actually, oh, but I'm going to pick a few of those up. You're ruining my... There you go. All right. There's enough. Here, stick your hand out. Just take a few of those. See, the thing is, I might just vent on him. And I might just throw up on him. And I might just take all that there. And I want you to see, like, like, hey, a bunch of it just fell on the ground. It did. But do you see how, I had to put some back on because you, you brushed it off. But there was a bunch more on there earlier, remember, right? <laughs> do you see how some of my words stuck on him? They impact him? Do you know what gossip is? It's telling someone else uh, something where they have n no business knowing. It's when you, you begin to tell someone a problem, that, and Chris can't help me with my problem, Chris isn't a part of the problem, but I just told them anyway. And what happens, I might be telling them about my friend Eddie again. <laughs> I'm sorry, Eddie. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I love it. So what happens is, now, now do you see, I, there's some stuff that got left on, on Chris. It impacts what Chris thinks about Eddie. Maybe not all of it, I mean, some of it fell on the ground, didn't really impact, but, but now he, he's carrying some things. See, words have impact. Words have lasting impact. And it didn't just free me up to vent it, but now it's, it's going to impact him. And the way he, he thinks about Eddie now is a little bit different. Because what happens is, is we took this stuff and we threw it here. And the Bible says that's not the place to throw it. But the problem with the tongue is because we throw it here instead of there. And what I want to show you is what we do with this the right way. Because if you throw this the right place, the tongue will be fine. If you throw it the wrong place, it is a fire set on fire by hell itself to cause damage, to change, and to imprint and implant the things of the enemy. Where my voice should be doing the same thing but implanting the motive, the heart, the thoughts of the Lord. I should be careful what comes out of the tongue. Thank you. Yeah. You, yeah. All right. So with that said, how do you know a little bit? So I, I found this. I, I tend to mutter. I've, I've mentioned this a few times. I tend to mutter and and and. Uh, some of the Lord's working on, but basically I'll say them, some things under my breath because I've been storing things up. I'm kind of frustrated. I've been storing it up and I'm muttering. I, I've learned this about myself. If I'm muttering, it means something. If I'm muttering, I'm not praying. Or I'm not praying enough. Because what I'm doing is I've, I've stored it up and I haven't taken it to the Lord. So I've learned this. If I'm muttering, I'm not praying enough. Now, your, your thing may not be muttering. It may be something else. But the reality is the answer is this. That if those wrong things are coming out of the mouth, be they quietly muttering or... Uh, loudly screaming, or anything in between, we're probably not praying enough. 
you're not pouring out your heart to God. What is the heart full of? It's full of anger, fear, trouble, pride, envy. Or is it full of kindness, mercy, gentleness, forgiveness, and wisdom of God? Um, here's how you get there. Psalm 62. Psalm 62, starting verse 1. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he's my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down? This leaning wall, this tottering fence, surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Just notice that this person's life is in shambles. It's not going well. Psalm 62 continues. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He's my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. You take that confetti, so to speak, and you pour it out to God. Now the thing is, I was talking to Jesus about this, this passage and so I'm going to tell you some things that I feel like the Lord told me about this. I'll readily, readily say it doesn't appear in the scripture, but I think it's implied. And the more I prayed and the more I meditated, the more the Lord just said, this is what's happening. He's saying, pour out your heart to God. Do you know what happens when you do? He will pour in. And you got something different to pour out. What God wants us to do is to pour out the junk so he can pour himself in. He wants us to pour out our fears. He wants us to pour out our anger. He wants us to pour out our frustrations. He wants us to pour out our concerns. He wants us to pour out our heartaches. He wants us to pour out our disappointments. He wants us to pour out every hard thing that's there, uh, all the things that we're going through. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And it's not saying that, that those things are a problem. Those things arise because you're going through a trial. Now when that is there, you pour it out. Pour it out towards the Lord. And when you pour it out, He will pour something else in. If you don't pour it out, He won't pour in you got to pour it out for him to pour in. So what happens in prayer? And I think many people miss this, and many people don't pray in the way I think God wants us to, because we think prayer is just like, oh, I'll just take a prayer. Request. No, you pour out your heart and you tell him how you feel. Do not be afraid to tell him you're angry. Don't be afraid to tell him you're frustrated. Don't be afraid to say you're disappointed. Don't be afraid. Don't, let, don't miss out on the fact that you have a God who cares about you, who knows you and wants all of it. It's an invitation. He's saying, I want to hear about it. And you know what? He doesn't get tired of hearing about it. Maybe you've experienced this where you've vented with someone, and after a time, you're like, I can't take this anymore. And you've kind of tapped that well too many times, right? So you've got to find another person. God does not grow weary listening to the heart that's being poured out. He doesn't grow weary. You pour it out. Now what happens is, when you pour it out, he pours in. What does he pour in? His comfort. You pour it out. It says God is the God of all comfort. He'll pour his comfort in. If you don't pour out the heart, you can't get the comfort. You pour it out and by pouring out saying, hey God, this is what I'm frustrated about. This is what I'm angry about. This is what I'm disappointed with. This is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm afraid of. You pour that out. Then he pours back in. What does he pour in? His comfort. You know what else he pours in? He pours in his peace. You know what else he pours in? His direction. Here's what you do. Here's how you handle this. Here's how you respond. He pours in his wisdom. He pours in his presence. Because sometimes we just feel alone. And we feel like we've got a friend in the world. We feel completely alone. We're like the only one. Well, the good news is that may be true, but you've got God. And you can pour out the heart to God. And when you pour out the heart to God, it doesn't matter if everywhere else is gone. He pours in his presence and you get his presence. You know what else he pours in? He pours in his truth. Because sometimes, while we're frustrated, we're believing something that's wrong. It's not true. And so he speaks a truth into it, and it corrects what was going on in our heart a little bit. So you pour it out, and he says, well, let me tell you what's actually going on. I've had the Lord many times correct me and show me, like, no, this is actually what's happening. This is the truth. I'm like, oh, okay. 
He pours in his thoughts. I don't think that's exhaustive. Please don't receive that as exhaustive because I think he pours in endlessly things. Pour out the heart so he can pour in. And you know what that does? It makes us mature, complete, and not lacking anything. Why? Because we're becoming more like him. Why? Because we poured out the heart. And what happens is he pours in. And so when he pours these things in, we become more like him. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because perseverance must finish its work. Remaining, abiding in Jesus. What is pouring out the heart? It's abiding. That's what it is. Abiding is saying, hey, God, this is going on in my life, and I'm struggling with that. It can even be, hey, God, I'm struggling with you right now. Why would you be afraid to say that? You might say, well, I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't say that. But if it's how you feel and pour it out, he can handle it. And then he can speak some truth into it. He can speak his peace into it. He can speak a, a lot of different things into it, but you pour out the heart. And when you pour out the heart, then he pours in. This is what we need. And if he pours that in, do you know what's going to happen to the tongue? Different things come out. Because if you have received his comfort, his peace, his direction, his wisdom, his presence, his truth, his thoughts, his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, um, all these other things, then, then what will happen is others will come out of your mouth will be those very words to other people. I think the sound team has something on the back. What's the question? What if you pour out your heart but don't hear anything from God? Wait. Wait. Sometimes God moves in imperceptible ways. Sometimes God moves in ways that um, it takes time for you to see the fruit of his movement. Wait. Don't give up because you didn't get an answer right away. There's a lot of healing just happens by pouring out the heart itself. And that allows God to begin to move. I can think of several things in Scripture that make me say, wait. And off the top of my head, here's one of them. Daniel, I believe it was Daniel. If I'm wrong on this, off the top of my head, just correct me. But it's one of these guys. I think it's Daniel. Daniel was praying. And it says this, while Daniel was praying and asking God for something, an angel of the Lord was dispatched from heaven to come to him and to bring him aid. Daniel waited for three weeks and nothing seemed to be happening. And in the heavenlies, here's what happened is, is uh, the angel, the messenger of the Lord, showed up finally to Daniel to bring the message from the Lord. And what it says, I've been delayed. Satan and his uh, demons, I was at war with them and held me up and I couldn't get here and I'm finally here. But the moment you said something, I was dispatched. There's one instance in scripture where it says that Daniel poured out his heart. God began to move. The response was delayed, but God's answer was not. God's answer was immediate, but the effects of it didn't come to fruition for several weeks later. Wait. Wait. I, th I think the other thing is, um, James will actually say this later. It says that you, you hear about, all right, let's, let's, James chapter 5. James chapter 5 says this, verse 7. Okay. Anybody waiting for Jesus to return? Because I tell you, I am, and I'm ready for it to be now. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm ready. Verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So I think in some ways I appreciate your question. James kind of anticipates that a little bit. Be, be patient. Wait for the Lord's answer. It's coming. Don't give up. You know, Peter will say it this way. The Lord's not slow in returning, as some of you think. He's not slow. Rather, he's patient, not wishing for anyone to perish. Why is he not here yet? Peter says, because he doesn't want anybody to perish. So he's waiting. Um, you know, I, I think also what happens is the fear of the Lord. 
If you want to be able to answer this question, dive into what it means to fear the Lord. Because it says this, um, God reserves um, His wisdom for those who fear Him. And Proverbs chapter 2 tells us what it means to fear the Lord. And part of Proverbs chapter 2 says that you search for God as though He's silver or, or gold, like hidden treasure. So you just keep searching and keep searching and keep searching. And God says, you want me that badly? I'll give you, I'll give you what you're looking for. Sometimes God is saying, how badly do you want it? Keep pressing in. Um, now, don't, don't turn it into like you got to pray and 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 pray to make it happen. Don't turn prayer into um, an idol. You know, it, it says very clearly, Jesus says, don't babble like the pagans. If you said something, I heard you. But, but pour out the heart and expect God to answer I just don't know when. If you have more questions about that, if we need to, to dive more into that, like, that's just off the top of my head. Um, grab me, call me, we can process together. But I want to end with this. Turn to 1 Kings. And I think um, in some ways this may even also address that, that question. We're, this won't be long, but we're going to look at uh, 1 Kings real quick because this is a quick example. 1 Kings in your Old Testament much closer to the beginning. 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 1 through 19. Uh, this is in this context. Let me give you a little bit of context. Elijah is a prophet of God. Elijah is a powerful prophet of God. Elijah is a man who, um, just a few chapters earlier, maybe even just a chapter earlier, um, was dealing with the prophets of Baal. So in that culture, there was a, a god of, uh, called Baal, and they would worship him. And this God had prophets, and they have 400 of them in this day with Elijah, 400 of them, and they basically want to say, whose God is real? Is it Baal or is it Jehovah? And Elijah says, this is no contest. And he says, you want to know who's real? Let's do this. Let's set up an altar, and whichever God, we'll, we'll cry out to our God, and whichever God brings down fire and um, takes up the sacrifice on the altar, that's the one who's God. This is the test. And so um, Elijah says, go ahead. So they build their altar, they put the sacrifice on it, and uh, they're crying out to God. Nothing's happening. They're crying out to Baal, I should say. They're crying out to Baal, and nothing's happening. And then they begin to whip themselves and cut themselves, trying to encourage Baal to respond. Nothing's happening. And so he says, why don't you cry a little louder? Elijah's saying this. Why don't you cry out a little louder? Maybe he'll hear you. Maybe he's just sleeping. You know, like, may maybe these different things are going on. And so he's just kind of encouraging them, and, and uh, as Paul's was kind of stoking the fire a little bit, right? Nothing's happening. And he goes, well, 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 what's going on? So at, at any point, um, Elijah's turn. He goes, okay. So he digs a ditch around his altar with the sacrifice on it, pours water over the altar so it's completely soaking wet, and then the, the, the ditch around it is now full of water. That's how much water he used. Because he's like, hey, you know, like, I just want to make sure we, we know who's God. He goes, hey, God, move. Fire comes down, burns up the entire sacrifice, and laps up all the water. It's all gone. Which one's God? After that, the 400 prophets of Baal are killed because they were worshiping something that's not God. Great victory. Jezebel is a queen in that time, and she is so furious at Elijah, she says she's going to go kill him because of what he's done. In response to this, Elijah is afraid, and Elijah runs. 1 Kings chapter 19. This will not be long. We're going to read it and pull out just two or three things. Starting verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. 
Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out, stand on the mountain, and in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And before we get to the Lord's second response, let's just make sure we understand what he said. Elijah's had a bad day. He's about to be killed. He feels like he's the only one. He says, I am it. They're dead. They've already been killed. They want to kill me too. I'm the only one. Jesus, kill me now. He's like, you do it. So he runs, sits on a tree and says, kill me now. And um, an angel shows up, taps on his shoulder, says, hey, here's some bread. Keep going. And uh, then he, he, he gets refreshed and he keeps going. What's not abundantly clear is it takes him 40 days. It is clear in here, but it takes him 40 days to get to Mount Horeb, which is the mountain of God. So basically what's happening is this, is that in his distress, Elijah is running to God. That's what's happening. But on his way to God, he gets tired. He says, I can't make it. So he sits under a tree and says, just kill me now. God meets him in his lack of strength and strengthens him with some bread and says, keep going. He gets to the mountain. He encounters God the first time. God's like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, here's the deal. I've been zealous for you. I've poured out my life for you. I've done everything right. They've killed all of them. I'm the only one. They want to kill me too. Why don't you just kill me now? He's a happy guy. And, and God says, hey, come on, come on out. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah says the same thing. Uh, I'm zealous for you. I'm doing the right thing. Just kill me now. What does God say? Verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Saphat, from Abel, Maholah, I doubt I got that right, to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. What does God say? Here's what I want you to see. Elijah poured out his heart to God. That's what he did. What did it sound like when he poured out his heart? Kill me now. I'm it. I'm alone. There's no one else here. They want to kill me. Just, just do it. Just, just kill me now. I'm done. He poured out his heart. When he poured out his heart, what does God pour in? He strengthens him. He strengthens him with food and gets him the rest of the way. He strengthens him with encouragement. He strengthens him with hope. And he strengthens him with truth. Here's what I want you to see. What's the truth that he poured in? Elijah, you think you're alone? You're not. There's 7,000 who haven't bowed their knee. You just don't know it. But I've reserved 7,000 of them. There's 7,001. You're not alone. He poured in truth. He poured in hope. He tells them, you go back here, and then this person and this person are going to take your enemies out. He poured in hope. He poured in partnership. He says, go and anoint Elisha. Now, many will read this, and I actually used to read it this way, thinking like God's saying, all right, go anoint Elisha, and he's going to replace you. And you, you see later, Elijah is just taken up into heaven, and people sometimes read this and go, that when he poured out his heart, God just said, I'm done with you. That's not what happened. 
It's just not abundantly clear. You have, to, you have to do a little bit of digging to find this out. When he anoints Elisha, do you know how long Elijah and Elisha are together? It's 23 years. 23 years. So when he poured out his heart, God said, Elijah, I'm giving you a partner. And Elisha, for 23 years, was an apprentice under Elijah. And for 23 years, they ministered together. For 23 years, God put an anointing on someone to walk through life with him. What happens when you pour out your heart to God? Truth comes in. Strengthening comes in. Help comes in. Direction comes in. Compassion, comfort. Pour out your heart to the Lord. And I use Elijah as an example because he's just brutally honest. What does it look like to pour out your heart? Just be honest. Because if you pour out your heart, he'll pour in. And if he pours in, the things that come out of the tongue are going to be different. And James is saying, watch out for your tongue. You can't control it. Yes, you can. If you take the things that you want to say and you take them to him, you pour it out. And then he pours in. And then the tongue, it's pure, it's life-giving, it's needed, it's refreshing. It's everything the tongue should be. What's coming out of the tongue? Is it this? Or is it this? And which way is it going? It's okay to have this. Just send it to the right place. Pour out the heart to the Lord. Does that mean don't pour it out to others? No, when you pour it out to others, just make sure they're actually praying for you. So if someone pours out their heart to you, because you can be on both sides, you can be the one pouring out or you can be on the receiving end. If someone pours out their heart to you, just do this. Hey, let's just take that to the Lord. Now you're pouring it together. Sometimes we need strength to go to the Lord and, and strength to pour it out together. And God tells us to share uh, our, our burdens with others so we can pray. Pray, but make sure you're actually not just dumping on each other. Pour it out to the Lord together. Um, and it'll make all the difference in the world. Here's what I encourage you this week. Go pour out your heart. Pour out your heart to the Lord. We all experience trials of many kinds. Pour out the heart to the Lord. Don't let this be a sermon like, hey, do you remember that cool example where you threw this confetti on Chris Hanger? Please don't let it be that. If, if that's what happens, then I, I screwed up. Please, let's be a group of people that walks out of here saying, I'm going to take my junk to the Lord. I'm going to pour out my heart. I'm going to let him pour in. Let us be a people that have been poured into from the Lord. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord receive all that's in your heart. And may he pour into you all that he has. May you experience his compassion, his gentleness, his wisdom, his guidance, his truth, his peace, his presence. And may you know the fullness of the Lord every day of your life. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God, it's really easy to have one. The Bible says we all have sinned, and we all fall short of God's glory. But it also says that the gift of God is this, that anyone who believes that Jesus died on the cross for our sins will have eternal life and eternal relationship with him. If you want to start a relationship with God, you just acknowledge your sin. Say, hey, I recognize I got that. And then you say, Jesus, I receive your sacrifice, and I invite you into my life. And Jesus will come in. His Holy Spirit will dwell within you. I just encourage you. Say something like that, Lord. If you want to right now, just say, God, I acknowledge my sin. I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I receive Jesus as my sacrifice, and I invite you into my life. And your life will change from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen.